It's about a mile down on the dark side of Route 88. Bruce Springsteen. There was a time when courtesy and winning ways went out of style, when it was good to be bad, when you cultivated decadence like a taste. We were all dangerous characters then. We wore torn up leather jackets, slouched around with toothpicks in our mouths, sniffed glue and ether and what somebody claimed was cocaine. When we wheeled our parents' whining station wagons out into the street, we left a patch of rubber half a block long. We drank gin and grape juice, Tango, Thunderbird, and Bally High. We were 19. We were bad. We read André Gide and struck elaborate poses to show that we didn't give a shit about anything. At night, we went up to Greasy Lake. Through the center of town, up the strip, past the housing developments and shopping malls, streetlights giving way to the thin, streaming illumination of the headlights, trees crowding the asphalt in a black, unbroken wall. That was the way out to Greasy Lake. The Indians had called it Wakan, a reference to the clarity of its waters. Now it was fetid and murky, the mud banks glittering with broken glass and strewn with beer cans and the charred remains of bonfires. There was a single ravaged island a hundred yards from shore, so stripped of vegetation it looked as if the Air Force had strafed it. We went up to the lake because everyone went there, because we wanted to snuff the rich scent of possibility on the breeze, watch a girl take off her clothes and plunge into the festering murk, drink beer, smoke pot, howl at the stars, savor the incongruous full-throated roar of rock and roll against the primeval susurrus of frogs and crickets. This was nature. I was there one night late, in the company of two dangerous characters. Digby wore a gold star in his right ear and allowed his father to pay his tuition at Cornell. Jeff was thinking of quitting school to become a painter slash musician slash head shop proprietor. They were both expert in the social graces, quick with a sneer, able to manage a Ford with lousy shocks over a rutted and gutted blacktop road at 85 while rolling a joint as compact as a Tootsie Roll pop stick. They could lounge against a bank of booming speakers and trade mans with the best of them, or roll out across the dance floor as if their joints worked on bearings. They were slick and quick, and they wore their mirror shades at breakfast and dinner, in the shower, in closets and caves. In short, they were bad. I drove. Digby pounded the dashboard and shouted along with toots in the maytals while Jeff hung his head out the window and streaked the side of my mother's bel air with vomit. It was early June, the air soft as a hand on your cheek, the third night of summer vacation. The first two nights we'd been out till dawn, looking for something we'd never found. On this, the third night, we'd cruised the strip 67 times, been in and out of every bar and club we could think of in a 20-mile radius, stopped twice for bucket chicken and 40-cent hamburgers, debated going to a party at the house of a girl Jeff's sister knew, and chucked two dozen raw eggs at mailboxes and hitchhikers. It was 2 a.m. The bars were closing. There was nothing to do but take a bottle of lemon-flavored gin up to Greasy Lake. The taillights of a single car winked at us as we swung into the dirt lot with its tufts of weed and washboard corrugations. 57 Chevy, mint, metallic blue. On the far side of the lot, like the exoskeleton of some gaunt chrome insect, a chopper leaned against its kickstand. And that was it for excitement. Some junky half-wit biker and a car freak pumping his girlfriend. Whatever it was we were looking for, we weren't about to find it at Greasy Lake. Not that night. But then all of a sudden, Digby was fighting for the wheel. Hey, that's Tony Lovett's car! Hey! He shouted, while I stabbed at the brake pedal and the Bel Air nosed up to the gleaming bumper of the parked Chevy. Digby leaned on the horn, laughing, and instructed me to put my brights on. I flicked on the brights. This was hilarious. A joke. Tony would experience premature withdrawal and expect to be confronted by grim-looking state troopers with flashlights. We hit the horn, strobed the lights, and then jumped out of the car to press our witty faces to Tony's windows. For all we knew, we might even catch a glimpse of some little fox's tit, and then we could slap backs with red-faced Tony, roughhouse a little, and go on to new heights of adventure and daring. The first mistake, the one that opened the whole floodgate, was losing my grip on the keys. In the excitement, leaping from the car with the gin in one hand and a roach clip in the other, I spilled them in the grass, in the dark, rank, mysterious nighttime grass of Greasy Lake. This was a tactical error, as damaging and irreversible in its way as Westmoreland's decision to dig in at Quezon. I felt it like a jab of intuition, and I stopped there by the open door, peering vaguely into the night that puddled up around my feet. 
The second mistake, and this was inextricably bound up with the first, was identifying the car as Tony Lovett's. Even before the very bad character in greasy jeans and engineer boots ripped out of the driver's door, I began to realize that this chrome blue was much lighter than the robin's egg of Tony's car, and that Tony's car didn't have rear-mounted speakers. Judging from their expressions, Digby and Jeff were privately groping toward the same inevitable and unsettling conclusion as I was. In any case, there was no reasoning with this bad, greasy character. Clearly, he was a man of action. The first lusty rocket kick of his steel-toed boot caught me under the chin, chipped my favorite tooth, and left me sprawled in the dirt. Like a fool, I'd gone down on one knee to comb the stiff-hacked grass for the keys, my mind making connections in the most dragged-out, testudinous way, knowing that things had gone wrong, that I was in a lot of trouble, and that the lost ignition key was my grail and my salvation. The three or four succeeding blows were mainly absorbed by my right buttock and the tough piece of bone at the base of my spine. Meanwhile, Digby vaulted the kissing bumpers and delivered a savage kung fu blow to the greasy character's collarbone. Digby had just finished a course in martial arts for phys ed credit and had spent the better part of the past two nights telling us apocryphal tales of Bruce Lee types and of the raw power invested in lightning blows shot from coiled wrists, ankles, and elbows. The greasy character was unimpressed. He merely backed off a step, his face like a Toltec mask, and laid Digby out with a single whistling roundhouse blow. But by now Jeff had gotten into the act, and I was beginning to extricate myself from the dirt, a tinny compound of shock, rage, and impotence wadded in my throat. Jeff was on the guy's back, biting at his ear. Digby was on the ground, cursing. I went for the tire iron I kept under the driver's seat. I kept it there because bad characters always keep tire irons under the driver's seat for just such an occasion as this. Never mind that I hadn't been involved in a fight since sixth grade, when a kid with a sleepy eye and two streams of mucus depending from his nostrils hit me in the knee with a Louisville slugger. Never mind that I'd touched the tire iron exactly twice before, to change tires. It was there, and I went for it. I was terrified. Blood was beating in my ears, my hands were shaking, my heart turned over like a dirt bike in the wrong gear. My antagonist was shirtless, and a single cord of muscle flashed around his chest as he bent forward to peel Jeff from his back like a wet overcoat. Motherfucker! He spat over and over, and I was aware in that instant that all four of us, Digby, Jeff, and myself included, were chanting, Motherfucker! Motherfucker! as if it were a battle cry. What happened next? The detective asks the murderer from beneath the turned-down brim of his pork pie hat. I don't know, the murderer says. Something came over me. Exactly. Digby poked the flat of his hand in the bad character's face, and I came at him like a kamikaze, mindless, raging, stung with humiliation. The whole thing, from the initial boot to the chin to this murderous primal instant involving no more than sixty hyperventilating, gland-flooding seconds. I came at him and brought the tire iron down across his ear. The effect was instantaneous, astonishing. He was a stuntman, and this was Hollywood, He was a big, grimacing, toothy balloon, and I was a man with a straight pin. He collapsed, wet his pants, went loose in his boots. A single second, big as a zeppelin, floated by. We were standing over him in a circle, gritting our teeth, jerking our necks, our limbs and hands and feet twitching with glandular discharges. No one said anything. We just stared down at the guy, the car freak, the lover, the bad, greasy character laid low. Digby looked at me. So did Jeff. I was still holding the tire iron, a tuft of hair clinging to the crook like dandelion fluff, like down. Rattled, I dropped it in the dirt, already envisioning the headlines, the pitted faces of the police inquisitors, the gleam of handcuffs, the clank of bars, the big black shadows rising from the back of the cell, when suddenly a raw torn shriek cut through me like all the juices in all the electric chairs in the country. It was the fox. She was short, barefoot, dressed in panties and a man's shirt. Animals! she screamed, running at us with her fists clenched and wisps of blow-dried hair in her face. There was a silver chain around her ankle, and her toenails flashed in the glare of the headlights. I think it was the toenails that did it. Sure, the gin and the cannabis and even the Kentucky Fried may have had a hand in it, but it was the sight of those flaming toes that sent us off. The toad emerging from the loaf in virgin spring, lipstick smeared on a child. She was already tainted. We are on her like Bergman's deranged brothers. See no evil, hear none, speak none. Panting, wheezing, tearing at her clothes, grabbing for flesh. 
We were bad characters when we were scared and hot and three steps over the line. Anything could have happened. It didn't. Before we could pin her to the hood of the car, our eyes masked with lust and greed and the purest primal badness, a pair of headlights swung into the lot. There we were, dirty, bloody, guilty, dissociated from humanity and civilization, the first of the Ur crimes behind us, the second in progress, shreds of nylon panty and spandex brassiere dangling from our fingers, our flies open, lips licked. There we were, caught in the spotlight, nailed. We bolted, first for the car, and then realizing we had no way of starting it for the woods. I thought nothing. I thought escape. The headlights came at me like accusing fingers. I was gone. Ram, bam, bam, across the parking lot, past the chopper, and into the feculent undergrowth at the lake's edge. Insects flying up in my face, weeds whipping, frogs and snakes, and red-eyed turtles splashing off into the night. I was already ankle-deep in the muck and tepid water and still going strong. Behind me, the girl's screams rose in intensity, inconsolate, incriminating. The screams of the Sabine women, the Christian martyrs, Anne Frank dragged from the garret. I kept going, pursued by those cries, imagining cops and bloodhounds. The water was up to my knees when I realized what I was doing. I was going to swim for it. Swim the breadth of Greasy Lake and hide myself in the thick clot of woods on the far side. They'd never find me there. I was breathing in sobs, in gasps. The water lapped at my waist and I looked out over the moon-burnished ripples, the mats of algae that clung to the surface like scabs. Digby and Jeff had vanished. I paused, listened. The girl was quieter now, screams tapering to sobs, but there were male voices, angry, excited, and the high-pitched ticking of the second car's engine. I waded deeper, stealthy, hunted, the ooze sucking at my sneakers. As I was about to take the plunge, at the very instant I dropped my shoulders for the first slashing stroke, I blundered into something. Something unspeakable, obscene, something soft, wet, moss-grown. A patch of weed? A log? When I reached out to touch it, it gave like a rubber duck. It gave like flesh. In one of those nasty little epiphanies for which we are prepared by films and TV and childhood visits to the funeral home to ponder the shrunken, painted forms of dead grandparents, I understood what it was that bobbed there so inadmissibly in the dark. Understood, and stumbled back in horror and revulsion, my mind yanked in six different directions. I was nineteen, a mere child, an infant, and here in the space of five minutes I'd struck down one greasy character and blundered into a waterlogged carcass of a second. Thinking, the keys, the keys, why did I have to go and lose the keys? I stumbled back, but the muck took hold of my feet. A sneaker snagged, balance lost, and suddenly I was pitching face forward into the buoyant black mass, throwing out my hands in desperation while simultaneously conjuring the image of reeking frogs and muskrats revolving in slicks of their own deliquescing juices. Arr! I shot from the water like a torpedo, the dead man rotting to expose a mossy beard and eyes cold as the moon. I must have shouted out, thrashing around in the weeds, because the voices behind me suddenly became animated. What was that? It's them! It's them! They tried to... tried to... rape me! Sobs. A man's voice, flat Midwestern accent. You sons of bitches, we'll kill you! Frogs. Crickets. And then another voice, harsh, arless, Lower East Side. Motherfucker! I recognized the verbal virtuosity of the bad, greasy character in the engineer boots. Tooth chipped. Sneakers gone, coated in mud and slime and worse, crouching breathless in the weeds, waiting to have my ass thoroughly and definitively kicked, and fresh from the hideous, stinking embrace of a three days dead corpse, I suddenly felt a rush of joy and vindication. The son of a bitch was alive. Just as quickly, my bowels turned to ice. Come on out of there, you pansy motherfuckers, the bad, greasy character was screaming. He shouted curses till he was out of breath. The cricket started up again, then the frogs. I held my breath. All at once there was a sound in the reeds, a swishing, a splash. Thunk a thunk. They were throwing rocks. The frogs fell silent. I cradled my head. Swish, swish, thunk a thunk. A wedge of feldspar the size of a cue ball glanced off my knee. I bit my finger. It was then that they turned on the car. I heard a door slam, a curse, and then the sound of the headlights shattering. 
almost a good-natured sound, celebratory, like corks popping from the necks of bottles. This was succeeded by the dull booming of the fenders, metal on metal, and then the icy crash of the windshield. I inched forward, elbows and knees, my belly pressed to the muck, thinking of gorillas and commandos and the naked and the dead. I parted the weeds and squinted the length of the parking lot. The second car, it was a Trans Am, was still running, its high beams washing the scene in a lurid, stagey light. Tire iron flailing, the greasy bad character was laying into the side of my mother's bel air like an avenging demon, his shadow riding up the trunks of the trees. Womp. 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 The other two guys, blonde types in fraternity jackets, were helping out with tree branches and skull-sized boulders. One of them was gathering up bottles, rocks, muck, candy wrappers, used condoms, pop-tops, and other refuse, and pitching it through the window on the driver's side. I could see the fox, a white bulb behind the windshield of the 57 Chevy. Bobby, she whined over the thumping. Come on. The greasy character paused a moment, took one good swipe at the left taillight, and then heaved the tire iron halfway across the lake. Then he fired up the 57 and was gone. Blonde head nodded at blonde head. One said something to the other, too low for me to catch. They were no doubt thinking that, in helping to annihilate my mother's car, they'd committed a fairly rash act, and thinking, too, that there were three bad characters connected with that very car watching them from the woods. Perhaps other possibilities occurred to them as well. Police, jail cells, justices of the peace, reparations, lawyers, irate parents, fraternal censure. Whatever they were thinking, they suddenly dropped branches, bottles, and rocks, and sprang for their car in unison, as if they'd choreographed it. Five seconds. That's all it took. The engine shrieked, the tires squealed, a cloud of dust rose from the rutted lot, and then settled back on darkness. I don't know how long I lay there, the bad breath of decay all around me, my jacket heavy as a bear, the primordial ooze subtly reconstituting itself to accommodate my upper thighs and testicles. My jaw ached, my knee throbbed, my coccyx was on fire. I contemplated suicide, wondered if I need bridge work, scraped the recesses of my brain for some sort of excuse to give my parents. A tree had fallen on the car. I was blindsided by a bread truck, hit and run. Vandals had got to it while we were playing chess at Digby's. Then I thought of the dead man. He was probably the only person on the planet worse off than I was. I thought about him, fog on the lake, insects cheering eerily, and felt the tug of fear, felt the darkness opening up inside me like a set of jaws. Who was he, I wondered, this victim of time and circumstance bobbing sorrowfully in the lake at my back? The owner of the chopper, no doubt, a bad older character come to this. Shot during a murky drug deal, drowned while drunkenly frolicking in the lake. Another headline. My car was wrecked. He was dead. When the eastern half of the sky went from black to cobalt and the trees began to separate themselves from the shadows, I pushed myself up from the mud and stepped out into the open. By now the birds had begun to take over for the crickets, and dew lay slick on the leaves. There was a smell in the air, raw and sweet at the same time, the smell of the sun firing buds and opening blossoms. I contemplated the car. It lay there like a wreck along the highway, like a steel sculpture left over from a vanished civilization. Everything was still. This was nature. I was circling the car, as dazed, as bedraggled as the sole survivor of an air blitz, when Digby and Jeff emerged from the trees behind me. Digby's face was cross-hatched with smears of dirt, Jeff's jacket was gone, and his shirt was torn across the shoulder. They slouched across the lot, looking sheepish, and silently came up beside me to gape at the ravaged automobile. No one said a word. After a while, Jeff swung open the driver's door and began to scoop the broken glass and garbage off the seat. I looked at Digby. He shrugged. At least they didn't slash the tires, he said. It was true. The tires were intact. There was no windshield, the headlights were staved in, and the body looked as if it had been sledgehammered for a quarter a shot at the county fair, but the tires were inflated to regulation pressure. The car was drivable. In silence, all three of us bent to scrape the mud and shattered glass from the interior. I said nothing about the biker. When we were finished, I reached in my pocket for the keys, experienced a nasty stab of recollection, cursed myself, and turned to search the grass. I spotted them almost immediately, no more than five feet from the open door, glinting like jewels in the first tapering shaft of sunlight. There was no reason to get philosophical about it. 
I eased into the seat and turned the engine over. It was at that precise moment that the silver Mustang with the flame decals rumbled into the lot. All three of us froze. Then Digby and Jeff slid into the car and slammed the door. We watched as the Mustang rocked and bobbed across the ruts and finally jerked to a halt beside the forlorn chopper at the far end of the lot. Let's go, Digby said. I hesitated, the Bel Air wheezing beneath me. Two girls emerged from the Mustang. Tight jeans, stiletto heels, hair like frozen fur. They bent over the motorcycle, paced back and forth aimlessly, glanced once or twice at us, and then ambled over to where the reeds sprang up in a green fence around the perimeter of the lake. One of them cupped her hands to her mouth. Al, she called. Hey, Al. Come on, Digby hissed. Let's get out of here. But it was too late. The second girl was picking her way across the lot, unsteady on her heels, looking up at us and then away. She was older, twenty-five or six, and as she came closer we could see that there was something wrong with her. She was stoned or drunk, lurching now and waving her arms for balance. I gripped the steering wheel as if it were the ejection lever of a flaming jet, and Digby spat out my name, twice, terse and impatient. Ah, the girl said. We looked at her like zombies, like war veterans, like deaf and dumb pencil peddlers. She smiled, her lips cracked and dry. Listen, she said, bending from the waist to look in the window. You guys see now? Her pupils were pinpoints, her eyes glass. She jerked her neck. That's his bike over there. Al's. You seen him? Al. I didn't know what to say. I wanted to get out of the car and wretch. I wanted to go home to my parents' house and crawl into bed. Digby poked me in the ribs. We haven't seen anybody, I said. The girl seemed to consider this, reaching out a slim, veiny arm to brace herself against the car. No matter, she said, slurring the tease. He'll turn up. And then, as if she'd just taken stock of the whole scene, the ravaged car and our battered faces, the desolation of the place, she said, Hey, you guys look like some pretty bad characters. Been fighting, huh? We stared straight ahead, ridges as catatonics. She was fumbling in her pocket and muttering something. Finally, she held out a handful of tablets and glassine wrappers. Hey, you want a party? You want to do some of these with me and Sarah? I just looked at her. I thought I was going to cry. Digby broke the silence. No thanks he said, leaning over me. Some other time. I put the car in gear and inched it forward with a groan, shaking off pellets of glass like an old dog shedding water after a bath, heaving over the ruts on its worn springs, creeping toward the highway. There was a sheen of sun on the lake. I looked back. The girl was still standing there, watching us, her shoulders slumped, hand outstretched.